So, Walter, what, what does the, the delay gratification process tell us? In the brain. In the brain, I think it's been useful to conceptualize essentially uh, two brain systems that are continuously interacting. Uh, but as one goes up, the other one goes down is a reasonable way to think about that interaction. So it's, a, it's, a, it's more of a metaphor than an accurate description of pieces of what goes on in the brain. But it's a useful metaphor for thinking about things that do have a reality in the brain. And I think of it uh, as involving two systems, one of which we can refer to as a hot system, an emotional system, a reflexive system, an automatic system, a system that's much closer to what Eric was talking about with the unconscious. It's automatic and it's essentially the natural default. It's what has the child ring the bell or take the cookie rather than activate the cool system. So what's the cool system? The cool system is cognitive, it's slower, it's more complex, it's reflective rather than reflexive. The hot system is probably largely amygdala and ventral striatum in the right. brain, so it's different areas. It has to do with fear and with the reward system. Uh, the cool system is much more prefrontal cortex. The hot system is there from birth. Um, the the um, uh, hot system is tremendously accentuated by stress, so it goes up exactly when we need it most. I mean, in some ways, it's good to have it go up from an evolutionary right. point of view. It meant that you had a, f a, a, a fight or flight response immediately, which was very good when we were in jungle conditions. It's less good when we're in a traffic jam. That brings me to Daniel talking about fast and slow system. Well, it's, you know, people from time immemorial have divided the mind into two uh, systems, and, uh, and Walter has the hot and cold, and I have a distinction between fast and slow right. system one and system two. And they are, well, because they are highly correlated, yes. but they're not identical. Right. The distinction, for me, the prototypical difference would be between what happens in your mind when I say two plus two, and something happens to your mind immediately, or when uh, I say 17 times 24, which again, you probably could compute, but it would take you time, it would demand effort, your pupil would dilate, a lot of different things would happen. Uh, system one and system two, um, are clearly system two is closer to what Walter calls the cold system, cool, cool, cool. system, cool, cool, not cold, <laughs> and clearly Very system, yeah, system one, as I, as I conceive of it, includes the hot system, but it's more than that, because it also includes, essentially, all the automatic functions of memory. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and so that's what brings 2 plus right. 2 to right. mind. Right. And system 2 includes, as I conceive of it, everything that demands effort, mental effort and control. And part of it is inhibition of impulses, and part of it is computational. All of these yeah. uh, demand effort. Give some specific effort. examples besides well, the uh, problem. System two will be involved whenever you have to make a choice. System, oh, oh, so, oh, oh, system two, to go back to Charlie's question, is involved when you're trying to wait for two cookies. Absolutely. Uh, so that's, and, and system two, we know, for example, that uh, when, when people are cognitively busy, when you ask people to keep seven digits in their head while doing other things, so their system too is occupied. Their ability to inhibit impulses is different. They use more sexist language, for example, mm. while they are keeping that material in their head. And in many other ways, you can see that their self-control is impaired. So there is a correlation. It's, it's very close between the resources that are needed for self-control and the resources that are needed for computation. So what do we learn from this in terms of our, I mean, behavior? Uh, in terms of how we go about thinking and making decisions uh, well, that are beyond that of a marshmallow? Uh, we learned that there are conditions under which we can trust our intuition ah. and conditions under which we had better not trust our intuition. And more yeah, importantly, exactly. we learn about cases in which we can trust the intuitions of other people mm. and those in which we should be very skeptical. So I don't know, how, do, how have we learned that? Well... What we have learned is that 
self-confidence or confidence in one's intuitions. This is something that people have when it's justified, when they have a skill, but you can also have a great deal of confidence in intuitions that are not based on skill. They are just based on events that happen in the mind um, which are not, are not reality. And that overconfidence is something that we can recognize. And, you know, there are professions which are, to some extent, I think, based on an illusion of skill. And that is true. People will tend to guess what the stock market will do. Right. They can't do it. If it could be done, it would be done. It's not doable. And yet people have the feeling that they can do it. And that is an interesting psychological phenomenon. Where does that confidence come from? 